Okay, this is the screencast for chapter seven, chapters eight, and we'll go ahead and throw chapter nine in here just for good measure. Uh, it's on population, community ecology, and also on human population. So uh, first thing we'll take a look at is a biological community. And uh, this just carries over again from our previous chapter on the biomes, just taking a look at what can grow in any particular area. Uh, you have a lot more diversity uh, based on the temperature as far as going towards zero latitude in comparison to the poles. Uh, knit structure and how is it related to location? Well again, as I just mentioned, as you uh, move a little closer to the poles, you have a lot more biodiversity and how this happens is just based upon the different number of niches that are available. So more biodiverse conditions as far as uh, plant materials go then you're also going to have more locations for uh, animal species as well. Uh, categories for uh, species. We can look at these different ways, but how we are going to look at these uh, is with native, non-native, indicators, keystone, and foundation, and the roles they play individually. So we'll break those down in just a minute or two. Uh, first on our list will be the native species and this is what uh, primarily has lived in a particular location and um, historically so the biggest change to this of course is humans as we move around more uh, many times we carry some species over that uh, we would like to have in different locations usually for agriculture or um, plants that of course we'll use as food and animals the same idea uh, we may use it as, as a management tool to eliminate some other type of species that we find a uh, nuisance. And uh, this is actually, you know, species spread quite a bit this way uh, today. Uh, Non-native are some that we call like invasive. And again, this can happen from either just by catching a ride. That's something that humans have introduced from one location to another. Or it could be something that just has blown into the location. But typically, these non-native species are usually good competitors, which is why they survive and they can find uh, a location within a new habitat. Um, warning signs in the ecosystem. This first one here is indicator species. So many um, ecosystems will have something present that can show a change in the environment, usually early on. And as it mentions here, uh, some of these changes in the ecosystem we can look at, especially with aquatic systems, is a change in temperature or the oxygen levels. And typically what we're talking about here are amphibians because their life cycle has different stages that uh, can be disrupted based on those uh, changes to temperature and oxygen. So here's our happy little frogs um, going through their different life cycles. And you can see as far as, you know, you have your adult stages and of course going through the eggs and the tadpoles and such. Uh, anything that happens within here, um, the changes in temperature, as we said, um, pH, oxygen, uh, a variety of things can be really observed quickly with amphibians. So I just gave a couple lists, but here's uh, several more that we can look at as far as some of these changes that can disrupt um, an ecosystem or at least for some species. Okay. Uh, keystone. Uh, keystone species is something that, uh, if it's removed or disrupted, can have a large impact on the community because of its role with species that may be above it or may be below it. But typically, keystone species are found, <laughs> uh, no pun intended here, are found at the top of the ecosystem. They're usually a top predator. But uh, the keystone is something that we find um, again, it kind of holds the community together. If we remove it, then the whole structure of the community could fall down. So a nice example of that is the wolf. Um, historically, you know, it's been a top predator, especially in North America. Uh, it's kept a lot of predators in check. Um, so for example, deer, 
uh, pre-colonial days, deer's population was much, much lower than it is today. Um, but because wolves competes with humans for deer, uh, we don't like them. So they have been hunted and they're almost hunted to extinction in North America uh, because of that competition. So what we have today is we have a smaller wolf population and actually we're trying to reduce it right now in Michigan. But the deer population is really, really large. So it's good for hunting, but as far as the health of the deer population, it's probably not as good to have this large of a population that we have. So foundation species. Um, basically what this will uh, come to is they have to have something else that allows them to come into an ecosystem or a community. So for example, you could have, as it mentions here, elephants coming through a community or an ecosystem and disrupting uh, a location. So they could knock down trees in a forest so that they can access maybe a food source. And in doing so, they open up the canopy and it allows uh, some new species to come in that were not there before. We mentioned this in a previous lecture, um, resource partitioning. So one of the ways that we can minimize competition is if species of birds can utilize different food sources in the same location. So as an example, all of these birds very much live in a tight community location, uh, but they minimize competition by grabbing food sources somewhere else within this uh, tree, this type of tree. So some are at the bottom, the middle, the sides, and as you can see on there. Um, and again, uh, eliminating or minimizing competition uh, allows more species to inhabit a uh, particular location. Uh, we talked about this one in class, which is uh, pretty interesting, how species of prey can defend themselves from predators. And as the top a couple up here show that, you know, we can uh, blend in with the community that allows us to not be seen by our predators. Uh, these two down here, uh, the beetle and the butterfly have a really good defense mechanism, which one is a direct uh, assault on its uh, uh, predator. And skunks do the same thing, and they very much are showy, as the butterfly here is, is as well, that it lets the predators know if you approach, you're probably going to have some problems. So the monarch butterfly, its defense is that it tastes bad. So it doesn't necessarily kill its predator, but the predators know that if I eat that, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. Um, with the poison dart frog, it's doing the same thing, that uh, it's going to uh, make its predator very, very sick, possibly kill it, but it has markings that very much tell its predator that, uh, again, you probably don't want to uh, eat me. Uh, the last two on here, uh, we have the butterfly, or excuse me, moth, and uh, this caterpillar that both look like a predator to what may be eating it. So it's possibly could scare off whatever predator may be trying to approach and uh, making a nice snack out of these. So it may, it's camouflaging itself. All right, so we'll try to knock this one out in about a minute or so, and we'll call it uh, the end of this particular lecture. Uh, we have a list here of some of the interactions, and this kind of leads to what we were just talking about. Uh, a mentalism, we don't see this one very often, so just put it aside, hold on to it. Uh, a mentalism is where one species that, uh, the original species, is doing something that doesn't necessarily help itself or doesn't hurt itself. Uh, but it does have a negative effect on the surrounding species in its area. So the, the example it gave in uh, one of the resources was uh, desert plants. They can put out a, uh, a chemical which doesn't help or hurt it, but does have a negative effect on anything in the surrounding area. Uh, cattle does the same thing where they will trample through grasses for no necessarily direct benefit of its own. But it does, of course, have a negative uh, effect on surrounding grasses. 
Uh, this one is much more common. We see this uh, in other books. Uh, commensalism is where one species, the remoras, they benefit by hanging out with sharks. Um, they usually stay really close and they get the scraps that the shark leaves behind. And the shark uh, doesn't benefit or it's not harmed by that relationship. Next one on here is competitors uh, or competition where the, for example, the lion on the savanna uh, definitely benefits by catching a prey and just conversely the prey, uh, well, not so much. Uh, we could also probably put in that category the uh, um, parasitism uh, where you have the parasite which is benefiting by taking food sources from its host and the host ultimately is being harmed by the loss of nutrition. Uh, the last one on here is mutualism which is a win-win for both species. Uh, for example, bees and flowers. Uh, bees get the nectar from the flowers and the flowers get dispersion of pollen to others um, of its kind. All right, so we'll call that a wrap for the first part of this chapter sequence.